Well, good morning. Uh, everyone seemed to be getting quiet there, so I will start. Um, so, no notices. I'm going to start off with some notices. Uh, we've got at the back, back in the corner, there's some flyers. Uh, they've got information about all our Christmas services. So, uh, on Sunday the 19th of December, 11.30, so in the morning there's an all-age nativity service. Then we've got a cow service at four o'clock at St. John's School Old Chapel, same day, so Sunday the 19th of December. And then obviously we've got Christmas Day and Boxing Day, so you've got two services in two days, so you can look forward to that. Um, next Saturday, next Saturday, there's carol singing going to be happening in Leatherhead uh, at 11 o'clock in the town on the high street, yeah? So John says, if you want to do that, can you let him know? You can WhatsApp him, you can email him, you can poke him on the back at the end of church and tell him as well that you would like to be involved in the carol singing. I don't believe you need to be good at singing to do carol singing because there's always someone else to drown you out. So um, you, need a choir. you just need a choir, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, apparently when you get a whole group of human beings singing together, they all sing in tune. That's actually a fact. So there you go. So as long as there's enough people. Uh, please join me. Actually, no, let's, let's read God's word and then we're going to pray. So uh, we're going to read from John chapter 3, verse 16. Obviously, we've moved away from our series in John for a bit um, as we've been looking at Ruth. But there's this um, very famous passage, but uh, at this time of year, a quite, quite an important passage to remember. You, you'll all know the first verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That wasn't his mission. But in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. Now that, that's what this time of year is about. It's about the light of the world who came into the world. And we're going to pray to him now. So please join me. Father God, we pray to you now. And we remember at this time of, of year that you sent your son. You sent him on a mission to save the world. And he came into the world not to condemn the world, but he came into the world on a mission to save the world. Lord, you sent him and you came as a little baby. Hardly anyone noticed him. You had to send shepherds to see him. The people of the land didn't recognize him. But we remember, Lord, today that you sent Jesus to come into the world to save his people from their sins. And we remember that he did indeed grow up and he did indeed die on the cross for our sins. And he did rise again from the dead and he ascended to heaven. And now we have this hope, this hope of forgiveness. We have this hope of eternal life. That is why we gather here this morning. We're not here just to come to church as some sort of tradition, but we're here to praise the living God, the one who is reigning in heaven right now, the one who has promised to return and to bring his people to himself, the one who has saved his people from their sins. Lord, and we praise you this morning that you saved us from our sins. We want to praise you this morning. We want to worship you this morning, Lord. You are worthy of our praise. We're astounded at your grace towards sinners like us. And we want to worship you today with our hearts. Lord, would it not be an outward 
worship? Will we not be praising you, um, but inside our hearts we don't really care? Will we not be standing here and singing, but in our hearts we wouldn't be bothered? Lord, we pray the opposite would be true, that in our hearts that we would be eager and keen to love you with all all of our being, that we would remember how much you've done for us and we would love to praise you. Lord, please help us now as we raise our voices to sing, as we um, pray to you, as John comes to speak, would we be eager to listen to what you have to say through your word. Lord, we pray you would be present this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing to that great God. We're going to sing about the fact he's so holy. There we go. Holy, he's set apart, he's righteous. Holy, 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 please stand up and we will sing the song.
Please be seated. And John, going to come to the children's talk? Yes. Yes, he's got a children's talk. Great. Yeah. That next. Okay, so I wonder um, who here likes a nature documentary? The stage of life I'm. But who here likes a few nature documentary? A few people. the time, aren't they? Oh, there we go. We'd never get into, would it? Well, we have a similar bit in our uh, passage today in the book of Ruth. I don't know about you, uh, but as we've been looking at the book of Ruth... book of Ruth, I've found it like a bit of a kind of a hug from God. I don't know about you, but in the book of Ruth, it's, it's felt like I'm being hugged by God. And
eagle looking after its little eaglets, this little bald, uh, tiny little thing that's in the nest that she's feeding and looking after. That is what God does for us. He turns towards us and he welcomes us in. And we see that most of all on the cross, don't we? As Jesus opened his arms on the cross, his wings on the cross, and we just simply have to turn to him. And as the verse says, take refuge under him. That's what we see in the book of Ruth, this foreshadowing, this picture that is preparing us for when Jesus comes. And that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning in here. If you're not in here and you're in Sunday school doing something equally fun, at the dinner table today, you can ask your parents, I'd love to hear more about that. Can you tell me? And hopefully you'll have a wonderful discussion about what you learned and what, what they learned. So let's pray that God would teach us this morning from his word, that we would feel that, that, uh, that welcome from the Lord this morning, that we would rest and find refuge in his wings. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we come together this morning here to praise you, to turn towards you. Lord, as we sit here towards, facing towards you this morning, would you meet with us? Would we find refuge in you? Lord, as we come to your word, would you feed us, provide for us, that we would go out this, this morning comforted, that we'd feel that we have uh, been filled, ready to go, and to serve you, Lord, to, to serve you under your refuge, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Something taken off. We, now we're going to have a third song. Um, so if the musicians can come up, uh, we're going to do Prepare Him Room. And in the last verse, if the young people can make their way out. History now unfold, see the stars shine on the virgin foretold. Angels sing and light up the sky, hope rings out in a newborn's cry. Swing wide, you ancient gates, for Christ is born today. So please stand up as we sing. Oh, 
Thank you, musicians. And now Richard's going to come up and pray for us. In thought, word, and deed, we have done wrong in your sight. they would speak out for truth in the public square and uphold your name as holy and righteous and true. May you bless all of us gathered here this morning and those who are away or isolating because of COVID and encourage each of us to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And according to your amazing grace and your steadfast love and your mercy, may you be pleased to save precious souls at our Christmas services this year, we pray. May you comfort those who mourn and those who are suffering through ill health and those whose spirits are weighed down with the cares and troubles of this world. May your grace and peace be multiplied to them in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. We offer our prayer in the name of and for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we're now going to stand and sing again, How Still the Starry Night Above.
If you can turn in your Bibles to Ruth, you need chapter 2, Ruth chapter 2. So last time it was pretty devastating for Naomi uh, and um, she's arrived back in Israel from the land of Moab. Uh, she's lost her, um, her husband Elimelech and her two sons and all she has left with her is Ruth and they've returned. So Ruth chapter 2. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favour. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Midianite Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she's continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now, listen, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favour in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And she said, I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gathered. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. 
So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with, this, with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. And now um, John is going to come up, he's over there, and speak to us. Great. Do please keep that passage open as we're going to be working our way through it uh, this morning. Can I just check this is working? Because last week it wasn't. <laughs> no. Would you mind clicking through the slides? I need to buy a new clicker. It's, it's like Christmas. I have plugged it in this time, Ben. Yeah, I know. It's even... Pl- it's even pl- oh, there we go. It is working. Okay, cool. <laughs> last week I didn't plug it in. That was the reason. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Great. It's lovely to be here with you this morning. Lovely to see all your smiley faces out there. And um, yeah, warm welcome from me as well. My name's John Herring. I'm the pastor here, if you don't know me. Uh, welcome to people at home if you're tuning in. Uh, I know we've got a couple of visitors online this morning who emailed me this week, so welcome to you. Um, we're continuing our series in the book of Ruth. We're in chapter 2, as we've just had read to us. I'm going to pray as we come to God's word. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you speak to us through your word, by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will be at work in every heart this morning, drawing us closer to yourself. Lord, be with us, uh, however distracted we might be this morning. Help us to focus, to fix our eyes on you this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Great, so last week we began looking at this amazing story of a a pretty normal uh, family living in this backward town called Bethlehem that no one would have really heard of in those days. Uh, And this town was struggling in a famine. And we saw the father of the family make um, a disastrous decision. This man was Elimelech, and his decision was to lead his family away from God's land and his people and into the land of their historic enemies, the Moabites. And we saw this with the irony of his name, meaning God is king, Elimelech is a symbol. He's he's symbolic of the picture of the the state of Israel, God's people at this time, as he turns his back on God, his king. And this decision does have dreadful consequences because turning from God is a dangerous move. In fact, turning from God is always the wrong move. And sure enough, his family end up in tragic circumstances. Elimelech and his two married sons die, leaving three widows in a foreign land, a perilous and hopeless situation. But then we saw that his widow, uh, sorry, saw that um, yeah, his widow Naomi had heard news, news of how the Lord Yahweh, in his faithful kindness and grace, had visited his people in Bethlehem once again, and given them food. And so Naomi, along with her daughter-in-law, turned back. We saw them journeying back towards the promised land and towards Yahweh, the faithful, covenant-keeping God of Israel. Yet we also saw that even as Naomi turned, she was still entangled in, in a bitterness of heart. To the point that um, her doubt and confusion led her to to try to send her uh, daughters-in-law back to their home in Moab. You see, Naomi's family turned from God. And as a result, she has lost everything. And so now, as far as she can see, God is against her. How can staying with her be good for her daughters-in-law? That's what she's thinking. She knew enough to know that turning back to God was the right move, yet not enough to be sure that he could truly be for her, that he could provide for her personally. 
But we, as readers of the story, have a different point of view. We look from the outside, don't we? We can see the whole picture. And as the chapter ended last week, we saw that there were two rays of light shining brightly into the darkness of Naomi's story. Chapter 1 uh, and verse 22 uh, said this, So Naomi returned, uh, and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, was with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So Naomi arrives back to a very different Bethlehem to the one that she left. Because she arrives not to famine, but to the harvest. You see, Naomi's return is set against the big backdrop of the amazing mercy of her God to his people. Having disciplined them for their hard hearts with famine, he has now turned once again in mercy towards them and provided food for them. Yahweh, the faithful God, has turned back to his faithless people, Israel. But the irony is that even though Naomi sees this, she doesn't expect him to turn to her personally in mercy. And so in verse 20 to 21, as she returned, she declares to the women of Bethlehem, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. All that Naomi can see is all that she hasn't got. And as a result, she assumes that God has turned his back on her. She wants people to call her bitter. So sure is she that God is against her. Yet the author is quick to remind us, Naomi hasn't actually arrived back in Bethlehem empty, has she? She hasn't arrived alone. She has her devoted daughter-in-law by her side. And despite Naomi's encouragement to her daughter-in-laws to turn back, we saw last week how Ruth refused. In fact, Ruth expressed an unexpected covenantal commitment to Naomi, which refused to let go. And back in chapter 1, verse 16, we saw what was at the heart of this extraordinary devotion as she said to Naomi, your God will be my God. In the darkness and bitterness of Naomi's situation, God has graciously provided in a way that Naomi least expected. Because God is at work in and through this tender-hearted Moabite woman who has more faith in Naomi's God than Naomi does. And whose faithfulness towards Naomi expresses God's own heart, own faithful heart. And his faithful sovereign hand is about to be seen as he leads Ruth into the path of another character through whom God is going to weave good into Naomi's life. Because now as we begin this second chapter, we're going to see more evidence of how God has indeed turned towards Naomi whether she sees it yet or not. Because now we're told in verse 1 about a relative of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech. Now this sentence is rich with hope as well. As we said last time, to be a widow in these times was perilous. A widow had no source of income, no provider, no security. But unlike in Moab, where Naomi was a foreigner and there was no care for widows, in Bethlehem there's family. And under the loving law that God established for his people back in the Old Testament times, widows were to be looked after by their deceased husband's um, extended family. And here at the beginning of our second chapter is another bright ray of light poking through the chinks in Naomi's darkness. Elimelech, uh, Elimelech Naomi's husband, led her away from God and into the darkness of his judgment. But here is a man now with a different heart. And so now we see that there's not just one, but two godly people that God has brought into Naomi's life. Two people through whom God is going to unexpectedly bring blessing into her life. Because in this chapter, we will see that God brings astonishing blessing 
to those who turn towards him. It begins with Ruth, who completely astonishingly takes the initiative to care for her mother-in-law, showing the extent of her commitment to her. Because as a single woman, alone and defenseless in a foreign land, she now proactively goes out to find food and work to provide for her and her mother-in-law. And yet as she heads out in verse 2, we're given another window into her heart. Because unlike Naomi, we see that she positively expects that Yahweh will provide. Look down with me at verse 2. Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favour. Ruth, the Moabite, goes out into a foreign land, confidently trusting that she will be provided for. And as we read what happens next, we, we can, sorry, as we read what happens next, we can almost imagine the, the twinkle in the author's eye as he writes verse 3. And she happened to come onto the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Ruth's faith is not disappointed. Because by God's gracious, sovereign hand, she miraculously wanders into the field belonging to no other than the worthy Boaz that we've just heard about. It, it would be too good to believe, wouldn't it? Unless you believe, as Ruth does, that God is at work for good. And so now Boaz enters the story. And it's an awesome moment. I just want you to picture it. It's early morning. The sun is just coming up over the cornfields. It's a beautiful scene. And in rides this man. This man that we're desperate to meet, Boaz, the owner of the field. You can picture it in a film, can't you? The hero arrives. And just listen now to how he greets his workers and how they respond. Look at verse 4. Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Is that how you walk into your workplace? Here is a man whose life is so saturated with a deep relationship with God that it pervades every area of his life. Here is such a godly man that as a boss, his primary concern for his workers is their godliness. Above finding out how their work is going, he cares for them and their spiritual walk with the Almighty. It's a beautiful introduction to this man, isn't it? And we will see that this moment is reflective of the whole of this man's life. That, that these aren't just kind of holy platitudes that, that he says is out of kind of religious conformity. Here is a man who's, who has a heart that reflects God's own heart in his words and deeds just as Ruth does. And now Boaz notices Ruth among the workers, and he asks for a report from his men about her in verse 5. Just have a look at that. Then Boaz said to his young man, his young man, who was, sorry, his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And a servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. Here we see that Ruth has not demanded a handout. She hasn't presumed the right to glean from the edges of the field as, uh, as would be her right under the law, even as a foreigner. All she has asked is to gather up the leftovers after the reapers are done. And she even asks permission to do that. We see Ruth has taken bold initiative in faith, but it doesn't mean that she's pushy or presumptuous. Her confidence in God is shown in the meekness and humility of true faith. A faith that leads her to action, for she's clearly an excellent worker, industrious and hardworking. Boaz's workers go on to tell him in verse 7, she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. And now Boaz 
uh, gives us an example of faith in action as well in verse 8. Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. I think in the middle of those verses, it's a sad indictment on human nature and our fallen world that Boaz has to say this, isn't it? But sadly, it's as contemporary as it is historical. That sin leads to abuse and mistreatment of the vulnerable. And Boaz knows that as a woman, not least a foreign woman, Ruth is vulnerable and at the mercy of men. Yet there's not a hint of manipulation or abuse of that, that vulnerability from him, is there? Quite the opposite. Boaz shows the sort of godly care and protection for Ruth that we wish we would see more of in our world, doesn't he? In his generous care for her, he shows an other person-centered leadership that sees, as a vulnerable foreign woman, her need for protection and provision. And he steps up to take that responsibility. And now we see Ruth's heart in her response, verse 10. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I'm a foreigner? She clearly understands the precariousness and vulnerability of her position as a Moabite woman in Israel. Yet we've seen she has had faith to trust that even as a non-Israelite, the faithful God of this people will care for her. But it seems that even so, she is completely taken aback at the extent of the care shown now through this man, Boaz, who owes her nothing. Her response is pure and utter, humble astonishment. So we see something about Ruth's faith that's interesting for us all. As she asks the question, why have I found favour? Why have you noticed me? Her faith hasn't led her to a sense of entitlement. Instead, she expresses a profoundly undeserving gratitude. There's no pride here. She's amazed by the grace of Boaz. And she, and she receives his grace with joy. Uh, John Piper says this, Grace is not intended to replace lowliness with pride. It's intended to replace sorrow with joy. Ruth can't quite take it in. But Boaz isn't out for any glory here. He's not uh, about to take the credit, verse 11. Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Clearly, Boaz sees any provision that he can provide as a simple outworking of the heart of his God, towards all who turn to him. His aim is to confirm to Ruth the rightness of what she has done in turning to the faithful Yahweh. And so he says, verse 12, the Lord repay you for what you've done. Now on first reading, it could sound a little bit like Boaz is answering her question by saying she's earned the Lord's favor through her good deeds. But what is it that Ruth has done? Well, Boaz's final sentence reveals it. A full reward will be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. What is it that Ruth's done? She's left Moab, and she has come to the faithful Lord, to Yahweh, to take refuge under his wings. As I said, I quite like nature documentaries, and recently uh, we've turned back to um, Planet Earth, you know, that amazing BBC uh, series from, from a few years back, and I've uh, been watching it with my kids in the evenings. And you get these kind of never-before-seen footage uh, where they've hidden for days kind of in a bush trying to get this amazing uh, picture or shot of uh, an animal. 
And it might be that you kind of, yeah, you get this sort of intimate scene a little bit like an eagle's nest. And in these beautiful scenes, we see the, the bald, uh, helpless eagle, eaglet rather, snuggling under the great, all encompassing protection and provision of their parents' wings. This is the picture that we have of the protection and provision of God. But Boaz's poetry here is not original. He's picking up on a beautiful picture we see introduced at the end of Deuteronomy in the Song of Moses, as he uses this very imagery of God as he cares for his people. Deuteronomy 32, verse 10. He found him in a desert land, and in the howling waste of the wilderness, he encircled him, he cared for him, he kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. I don't think that's an eagle, but it's a, it's a nice sound. <laughs> Boaz knows well the God who, like an eagle, carries and shelters his people. Yet he knows a truth even greater, an unexpected truth that most Israelites at this time had struggled to grasp that the God of Israel opens his wings to cover anyone who will turn to find refuge underneath them. And that is what we see here, uh, sorry, him confirming here for Ruth. The answer to her question, why have I found favor, is that she has received blessing because she's turned and trusted in the Lord. She sought refuge under his wings. And astonishingly, there is a reward for doing so. God rewards those who turn to him. What a wonderful thought. Now often, when we read the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, often we can very quickly make heroes of the characters. And we seek to kind of put ourselves in their place and kind of to to be like them. We kind of overly moralize it. Uh, when often that's not the point. But here, I think it is clear that we are supposed to see the godly characteristics in these two characters, Ruth and Boaz, whose hearts and actions are to be admired and imitated. Because in them both, we see examples of hearts that trust in the Lord and are actually a re- just a reflection of the heart of God himself as we'll see in the remainder of the chapter, God brings astonishing blessing through those who turn towards him. Because the amazing thing is that Ruth and Boaz not only trust in the Lord, but as we've seen, they express that trust in imitating the love of the Lord in the way they care for others. In one sense, Ruth took a huge risk to leave her home. And, and a family to accompany Naomi back to, to Judah. And there's a sense that Boaz takes a risk as he humbles himself to provide for Ruth. In a world where throwing your weight around and capitalizing on your own power earns you status, Boaz takes a very different path. And maybe it cost him some, some street cred. Maybe there were rumors and mockery, as there so often is when a man goes against the tide. But for both Ruth and Boaz, their resolve to act out their faith comes from the humble confidence of living under a mighty and merciful God, under whose wings they find refuge. Knowing she was under God's wings enabled Ruth to forsake human refuge and give herself to love to Naomi. And knowing he was under God's wings compelled Boaz to act in line with the very heart of God. Modern day society, it encourages us to think we're entitled to home comforts, to peace and to joy. And that we should uh, look out for ourselves first. We see it all the more at Christmas, don't we? Often at Christmas time, we see the entitlement spill out of our hearts and into our lives. Christmas lists turn into Christmas demands. Festive gatherings boil over as someone takes offense at the slightest uh, remark or action. 
And entitlement can show up in how we relate to God as well. It shows up when we start to take his mercy lightly, when we think that we deserve it, that we merited it in some way, or when we forget his mercy altogether, and so we're slow to be merciful to others. That should not be the way of the Christian. Because for those who trust in God's provision and know the wonder of his undeserved mercy and grace, there should be a direct outworking of this in the way that we live. It should lead us to take risks, to be willing to forsake comfort, to go out on a limb and to live for him and for others, not ourselves. It should lead us to be gracious to others, even when there's no benefit to ourselves. To go against the tide and to show grace to those who others would overlook. How will knowing God's mercy shape your Christmas? Christian love is humble and radical and bold. And because it comes from knowing we serve a great God who has poured out his favour on us, who don't deserve it, and know that love radiates from within us. Because nothing we can give will ever compare with all that he has given us and will continue to give us. And Ruth shows us this. By faith, she trusted from afar that Yahweh is the covenant God who keeps his promises and cares for his people. And she's acted on that trust, working out her faith in confident, humble action. And now she's beginning to experience the blessing of the God that she has trusted through, through the care of this man who provides for her above and beyond her expectations. Verse 14. Just have a look at that. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she be sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied. And she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Boaz generosity and protection are astonishing in the context, aren't they? And the result is that Ruth eats of the bread and drinks of the wine and is fully satisfied. There are so many New Testament allusions here, aren't there? And in fact, Boaz's provision is so bountiful that it can reach even further. Verse 17, we're told, uh, she, Ruth, gleaned in the field until evening. Then she built beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley and she took it up went into the city her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned as the passage closes we see the light of God's love is finally breaking through for Naomi as well through the unexpected faithfulness faithfulness of Ruth and the astonishing generosity of Boaz Naomi, the one who has declared herself empty, receives astonishing blessing from the Lord. Because this, this chapter is not just a story of Boaz's goodness to Ruth, but of the Lord's goodness through two faithful people to Naomi. You see, in, in Boaz's faithful, compassionate, merciful love of Ruth, we, we're meant to see the faithful, compassionate, merciful love of the Lord to all who turn to him. Last week we saw that turning back to God is always the right move. Even when, like Naomi, we do it imperfectly. Even when in doubt and fear and confusion, we do it very humanly. Because anyone who turns to God will find that he has already turned towards them. Even before they knew it. And this is what we see more of today. As Ruth brings home to her the overflow of grain that Boaz has provided, Naomi exclaims, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Verse 20. We see that Naomi is beginning to see 
and believe the kindness of the Lord towards her. She's beginning to see the same truth confirmed for her as Boaz has confirmed for Ruth. That turning back to the Lord is always the right move for anyone. It's the right move no matter who you are, an Israelite or a Moabite. And it's the right move no matter what you've done. No matter how far you've turned away from him. No matter how deep your sin how devastating the effects of it have been on your life. How far from him you feel. How empty. However bitter. No. God will have mercy on anyone. Israelite or Iranian. English or French. Syrian or Australian. Anyone who humbles himself like Ruth and takes refuge under his wings. God will have mercy on anyone who turns back to him, no matter what they've done. Because the unexpectedly good news of the gospel is that God already turned towards us before we turn to him. God is at work behind the scenes to bring astonishing blessing to all those who turn to him. Even if your life, like Naomi, feels bitter right now, Even if you feel like all you can see is darkness, take heart. If you've turned to him, you can be sure that he is working behind the scenes in ways that you cannot see, in astonishing ways, to bless you. You can be sure that even before you turned to him, he was working for your good. Because you you see, in the unfolding of this love story between Ruth and Boaz, we're supposed to see the foreshadowing of the greatest love story. A love story that reaches beyond itself into every single dark story. Because through Boaz, sorry, though Boaz was a great man, there was one who was better. A man who was not just a worthy man, but who was perfect. And shows us the fullness and faithfulness of the Lord's provision. And in whom we can find complete satisfaction. A man to whom the whole world's riches belong. But who gave it all up to provide us with eternal refuge. You see, Boaz's great, 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 great grandson's name was Jesus Christ. And in his kindness, he came down, leaving the riches of heaven and became a man to save us, to welcome us into his family, to make you an outsider, a child of God and an heir to all that he has, all that is his. The story of Boaz and Ruth is a love story within a greater love story. Because as these two characters begin to move towards each other, we see God's big love story for the whole world coming together. It's as if Boaz's character here gives us an outline of the kindness and love that Jesus Christ will perfectly color in. Because as Jesus spread out his wings on the cross, he paid the price for all the sin of this world. And as he rose again to defeat death, he made it possible for anyone to be welcomed back into the arms of our Father God. That's why turning back to God is always the right move. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, it's no accident that you're here. And if you are a Christian but struggling to see past the bitter circumstances of your life, today he's calling you to look up. The the Lord is calling you today to turn to him, to seek refuge under his wings. Because he is for you. He is at work behind the scenes, often in unexpected and astonishing ways. He He has already opened his arms to you. And he welcomes you to the abundant, overflowing table of his love, which will last into eternity. What a wonderful hope. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity this Advent to turn to your word in the book of Ruth. Lord, we thank you that in this little love story in the middle of nowhere, that you were bringing together the greatest love story. That through Boaz's line, a man who, in whom we see the characteristics of Christ, Lord, you would bring about that very Christ who would fulfill that picture fully, who would reveal the love of God in the most miraculous and wonderful and astonishing way as he died on the cross for us. Lord, whatever situation we find ourselves in this morning, would we turn to you? Lord, as we turn to communion now, would we remember your blood poured out for us on the cross, your body given for us, that sacrificial love? Lord, would we remember it? Would we find that true hope in it? And would we emulate it in our lives? And so we pray as we come to the table of communion now, Lord, we would reflect on our own hearts. We would consider the ways that we have not loved you. Lord, we would turn to you. We would turn back to you. And Lord, would we remember your forgiveness. Lord, would we remember that refuge. Let's take a moment now to consider these things. Lord, as we come to your table, we thank you so much for your forgiveness. We pray that we would fix your, our eyes this morning on you as we remember the cross. As we eat of the bread, Lord, we remember your body. And so we partake of it now with our eyes fixed on you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Nicola's gonna, and, uh, Nicola and Nick and anyone else needs another hand? Is that enough? They're going to bring around the bread now. Uh, just remember there are three bits of bread in each little parcel. Uh, so if you can kind of distribute that sensibly uh, and make sure that you, everyone gets a bit of bread, uh, we will eat uh, and remember Jesus' body broken for us.
We're now going to uh, have the wine pass around, or the grape juice. Um, please do take uh, one each, and um, uh, yeah, as it comes around, please just take, take it, hold on to it, and at the end we'll, we'll drink together as a sign of our unity in Christ. So yeah, hang on to your little, little glass. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> Let us drink together the blood of Christ that takes away our sins. We're going to sing a final carol, uh, the first of our carols, proper carols. Um, it's a, a manual, uh, sorry, a come come Emmanuel, slightly contemporary version, but uh, hopefully easy to sing along as you'll, you'll know. Uh, the traditional tune. Um, so as the music starts, please do stand and sing.
shall come again with us to dwell. Let's just pray to close. Dear Lord, would we take refuge under your wings? Would we not look to things in this world to be our refuge, but you, O oh Lord, would be our refuge, the one that we go to in our need, and that we would not believe the lies that are told around us, but we would believe your word, Lord, trust in you, that we would be quick to come to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There are.